seated. Thank you so much for coming tonight. We are so glad that you chose to visit us at the Zion Church. And it, it really is an honor to bring the Word of God to you tonight. And um, if you will, turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. And I'm going to get my slides figured out before we have another review of the announcements. <laughs> Matthew chapter 26 in your Bibles.
She had worshiping hands. So my question to you is, what kind of hands do you have? Are they worshiping hands? And according to this woman's testimony, it's not really true worship unless it costs you everything. All your time, all your talents, all your abilities, your energy. Have you given them everything? Otherwise, it's not really worship. See, you and I can come in here tonight and we can raise our hands to worship. We can lift our hands from beginning to end. We can go through the whole service, you know, lifting our hands, praising Jesus, but our hands can be dirty because during the week, from day to day, we're not worshiping Jesus. We haven't given Him everything. See, our hands are closed. The true sign, the true test of worshiping hands is whether your hands are, are closed or whether they're open. See, if they're open, then those are worshiping hands because Jesus can, can bless you with what He wants you to bless you with. He can take away what He needs to take away. He has His way in your life. But when your hands are closed, when they're clenched, they're, those aren't worshiping hands. And many of us come into the night and we have clenched fists, we have closed hands, but yet we raise them in worship, but we're not really worshiping. We're not really worshiping at all. So I ask you to look at your hands tonight. Are they worshiping hands? Have you broken your will for His? Have you poured yourself out so that you can be filled with His power and His presence? Do you have worshiping hands? Let's move on to the second one. And Richard, you might have to do this because my phone keeps going in and out. So the second one is betraying hands. Betraying hands. The next scene we find betraying hands in verses 23 through 25. Matthew writes, He answered, this is Jesus talking. He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. This is, of course, the famous Last Supper scene with Jesus and his twelve disciples. He tells them that they all will betray him. They all had dipped with him in the dish. But one in particular would openly give him over to the Sanhedrin. And can you imagine being Judas in this moment? As all twelve go around one by one, one after the other, asking, Is it I? Is it I, Lord? Is it I? And Judas dips his bread in the dish with Jesus, and he asks, Is it I, Rabbi? There's that awkward silence. As Jesus' all-knowing eyes pierce into his own, and sees the true nature of his heart. Yet with all the compassion, and all the sadness, and all the love, and all the hurt, Jesus replies, you said it. Talk about crushing. I mean, if I had spent my whole life following a man who I believed was my Savior, who was worth my life to follow, and for him to tell me that I was going to betray him, that I was going to turn out to be a fraud, a phony, just a traitor. I mean, that's just crushing. I can't even imagine. I mean, I, would, I don't know that I have the strength to live life if, if God were somehow to show me the end of my life and say that I don't make it, to say that I didn't finish running my race, to say that I turned out to be a phony, a fake, a fraud. But see, Judas, his heart was too hard to care. He was too hardened to let the disappointment in Jesus' eyes convict his traitor soul. Judas had betraying hands. Do you? Has Jesus continued to come after you over and over with love and compassion? Over and over and over again. He pleaded with you to come back to him. He pleads with you to embrace the love that he has to offer. But you deny it. You deny it over and over and over. Believing in your hardened, cold heart that life would just be easier if God didn't love you. If God just didn't love you, your life would be pain-free. You'd be fine. You'd live life with no fear, no regrets, no consequences, no conscience. If you could just forget about everybody and everything that loves you in this world, you'd be your own tyrant king. But it's those past sins, it's those past failures, it's those wounds that he keeps pressing on. Calling for you just to answer, just to respond, just to come back to him. You've claimed him once, remember? Remember the night that you realized you couldn't do it anymore, you couldn't live life alone? 
you asked him to come into your life to take over. You said that you would change things. You said you'd give it all to him and rest in his arms. See, you've tasted the salvation of the Lord. You've felt his forgiveness and mercy. And although it's extremely painful for you now, you remember what it's like to live in that freedom, in that grace. So look at your hands. Look at them. Are they betraying hands? Some of you just need to be honest tonight. And just come clean. You've, you've sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. You've sold him out for worldly pleasures. Remember the part of the son? He lived as though his father was dead. John Purvis touched on this at the hill. He took his inheritance. He ran with it. There was a, a decent Jewish young man coming from a very reputable family working in a pig farm. He'd come to his wit's end. He's feeding the pigs. He's slopping the pigs, and he's eating, even eating the same thing that he's feeding the pigs with. He's at the bottom of his life. And finally, finally, he came to his senses. His will is broken. His pride is broken. He realizes it would just be better if I could just go home and work for my father as a servant. I can work for him. He doesn't even have to pay me, but at least I'll be better off. I'll be on my father's house. And um, the father is a perfect picture of Jesus. He's there waiting with open arms. He's there waiting at the end of the road, waiting for his son to come back. And his arms are stretched wide open in love. And they threw a party for that son that night. They threw a party for him. And he was welcomed with love into the family that night. So I'm asking if you have betraying hands. And I'm asking for you to come to that point where you realize that you can just come back home. It's okay. You can just come back home to your father. And he'll accept you with loving hands. He'll accept you with wide open arms and grace and mercy. Or you can live life like Judas who after selling Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver, the guilt that he bore was so heavy that after Jesus was taken and arrested and it was him who was responsible for that, he went back to the temple, he threw the silver down in the temple, ran out and hung himself because he couldn't live with the guilt. So either way, if you have betraying hands, you're headed for your own destruction. But if you could just realize that the Father is waiting for you, He's beckoning you. He's calling you back home. If you'll just respond. If you'll just say, yeah, I'll come back home. So I'm asking you tonight, just be honest with yourself. Look at your hands. Are they betraying hands? Are you here tonight as a phony? Are you here tonight as a fraud? Why are you at the side of church tonight? What brought you here? Are we going to find out later on that you just turned out to be a traitor? That you sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. You, you sold Jesus out for worldly pleasures. Look at your hands. Are they screaming Judas? Actually, are they saying Judas in your face?